Thank you, Norma Jean. This morning we have a guest speaker, Dr. Rabbi Andrew Etten. Rabbi Etten has been the spiritual leader of Temple Israel in Salisbury, North Carolina since 1990. He served two one-year terms as interim religious leader of Temple Emmanuel in Winston-Salem, and has been the Jewish chaplain at Wake Forest University and formerly at the Blumenthal Home for the Aged, as well as visiting religious services leader for Congregation Emmanuel in, uh, Emmanuel in Statesville. He's also spoken to us a number of times. He's experienced in leading reform, renewal, and traditional services. Dr. Etten is currently adjunct professor at Wake Forest University in the Department of the Study of Religions and the School of Divinity. He is also the husband of longtime UUFWS member, Carol Stewart. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. and Rabbi Andrew Etten. Good morning. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you all for participating in this service. Now, I was reflecting on the chronicle of this past year when that little voice in my head prodded me, oh, don't forget about the wildfires, the vault. Oh, and the hurricanes, remember the hurricanes? A record number of those as well. I could have forgotten. There was so much else. And too much of it was painful to experience and just as bad to recall catastrophic fires, wind and floodwaters would have seemed bad enough without a worldwide viral epidemic that was even more destructive. But added to the unleashing of natural forces are the injuries that we human beings do to one another. For this was also the year when we were forced to confront once more, but urgently, the societal violence to which black people continue to be subjected to confront also and yet again, deeply ingrained physical and economic offenses against women and the marginalizing, menacing and exploitation of so many other people because of so many prejudices and resentments. The ongoing political assaults against human rights and against our environment. And on reflection, we also had to see that the consequences of even the afflictions from the natural physical world were triggered or worsened by human failures. In our country, that includes, for example, the role of faulty and aged Pacific gas and electric equipment in starting and spreading many, if not most, of the devastating California fires over the past two years. And it surely includes blundering executive non-leadership in this country and elsewhere in the path of COVID-19, as well as in response to the shootings by police officers of unarmed Black women and men. There is blame enough to go around, an overabundance of justified worry, grief, and anger. And when we thought we might be done with it, we have the election that just won't end. We could write our own book of lamentations or even reflect on the biblical one, which is not such a bad idea because one of that book's main themes is, we did this to ourselves. I begin with this too brief and too depressing recollection of woes because I want to talk about looking for nuggets of hope. And I do not want to set out for you some mindless optimism about life, the world, or the human condition. It might be true that all's for the best in the best of all possible worlds, but this is not it. We need to help to improve it. A great rabbi at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, Nachman of Breslov, taught that we need to seek joy actively don't just wait for it to come to you. Depression can arrive on its own. Without us doing anything to bring it on, it just shows up. Disappointment arrives, unasked for. One of his students was asked how he could speak of joy when he was afflicted by so many worries, and he replied, borrow the happiness, borrow the happiness. Find some cause for joy somewhere in life and put that to use. 
what these teachers perceive is that our woes, as they pile on, can pull us into a downward spiral that leads to inaction because we cannot see how to counteract the negative forces that are tugging us under. Looking for hope, looking for something that brings happiness, need not be escapist. It does not mean closing our eyes to suffering or to injustice. Instead, it can be our counterattack against them. And still I rise, as Maya Angelou wrote. How easily we forget amid the cares of daily living and the extraordinary anxieties and burdens we have all carried during this past year, that we exist surrounded by gracious stores of hope, sustenance, imagination, and goodness. How often we have had occasion this year to take note of them. They may be grand in scale. The examples of selfless work by medical personnel, for instance, at the risk of their own lives. They may be modest in scale, but precious and sweet nevertheless. The rescue and rehabilitation of a tiny owl discovered in the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. For many religious believers, these are blessings from God. Other people may think of them rather as the gifts of nature, the endowments of resilient spirits, the bravery and the creative resources of the human will and intellect. There's a corollary to the familiar advice, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. The corollary is, you can't fix it if you don't know that it's broken. This year, the fissures, the breaking points, have become unmistakably visible, not only here, but around the world. We have seen exposed, previously overlooked or underestimated problems in healthcare and the elder care systems and the enormous consequences of those problems. We have seen how a disease such as COVID-19 proves to be not simply an equalizer of all ages, classes, and races amid a universal threat, but it affects ages, races, and economic classes disproportionately. Who knew? Just as clearly, we have seen suddenly that the work of many people whose jobs have been underappreciated, undervalued, and underpaid now turn out to be essential labor. In this country, we are being pushed to look more critically at how police office, officers are recruited and trained and operate. And we have the impetus to think again about how we elect our leaders and what sorts of leaders they are. We are even challenged to communicate what many of us may take for granted, the objective truth of provable facts facing off against an onslaught of hypotheses, conjectures, fantasies, phobias, and simple but monumental lies. We discover that even as we lose faith in some institutions, others become bulwarks against the onrushing tsunami. In 1939, ominously right before the start of the war, the British writer E.M. Forster wrote an essay called Two Cheers for Democracy. This year, perhaps we can still manage one cheer we could sit and sulk, resentfully wondering, for example, why New Zealand deserves to be led by Jacinda Ardern and we do not. But if all we do subsequently is look at our disappointments and grievances and shake our heads woefully without doing anything with our clearer insight, we miss the opportunities to find something valuable amid the muck and mire through which we have waded and to do something helpful for the future. We are resilient, inventive creatures. 
proof of that is all around us. And that alone is worth recalling. How can we work? How can we teach when it, is, when it isn't safe for teachers and students to work in the same room? How can we maintain a congregation if we can't congregate? How can we get groceries if we dare not walk into a store? How can we vote if we are reluctant to be around a crowd? How can we talk to one another if we have to wear masks? How can we connect with family and friends if we cannot gather in person? Will there still be restaurants? We have discovered that it is all possible. It may be imperfect. It is imperfect, like the clerk and customer trying to make themselves understood to one another through layers of fabric, but it can be done. Life, including social interactions, need not come to a halt. We find ways by adapting old techniques or adopting new ones. We shift from our customary ways and in so doing, we can refine and adjust how we want to live and work, what we really want to do and how we want to do it. And there are surprises of all sorts. Denied the possibility of actual travel, we browse YouTube discovering that in one moment, we can watch a live cam showing an exceptional variety of spring birds, all exotic to us at a mountainside feeder in South Africa, and at a whim, jump to another live cam showing birds fishing for salmon at a river in Alaska, or yet another streaming the Aurora Borealis in Lapland. We can tour museums we never imagined getting to in person seeing and hearing lectures about art that we could never approach that closely or knowledgeably, even if we were there. We can be introduced to places we had only heard about, better yet, places we had never heard about. Yes, live is a falsely optimistic term here. We are viewing these, to use a now fashionable term, synchronously, in the moment, Nobody would ever mistake these two-dimensional video experiences for really being there. They are like cooking shows in which the food looks good, but we can't smell or taste it. Yet they are worth something to our imagination and understanding. There are larger gains as well. College students, for example, realizing that many of their classmates are in severe financial and logistical distress, voluntarily crowdsource to provide emergency funds and even emergency housing for one another. Arts organizations combine their archives, their artists' creativity, and the resources of the internet to offer performances, lectures, and symposia, sometimes for a fee, but often for free or a voluntary contribution to people who otherwise might never have been able to experience that museum, see that concert, learn about that aspect of culture. They have found ways to function that perhaps in the long run might open additional paths for creative discovery and expression after being pushed into a crisis not of their own making. Is it perfect? Will it do? Some years ago, the great violinist Yitzhak Perlman was performing a concerto with an orchestra when one of his spring, one of, one of his strings on his violin broke. It was during a section of music when he could not simply exchange violins with an orchestra member. And it would have been especially difficult for Perlman to do that anyway, because as a child, he contracted polio which cost him the use of his legs. So he gets onto the stage using two canes and he plays seal. He could not simply get up and trade instruments in the middle of the performance. Instead, while the orchestra played, Perlman applied his years of experience to rethink the fingering of his remaining part and extraordinarily played the difficult finale of the concerto 
on three strings instead of four. After the performance, when the audience's applause finally subsided in response to his upraised hand, he said in his sonorous, deep voice, sometimes it's about figuring out what you can do with what you have left. This we have been doing. The alchemists of old never managed to turn lead into gold. We are the prospectors of today who have the possibility of discovering nuggets of gold in the muddy stream of our time. Yes, we might need to look hard and not be discouraged when we fear that the load has been depleted. We might value the help of some clear-sighted guides. Still, we should believe that it is there our discoveries will become the treasury of the future. And I thank you for the privilege of talking to you today. Life is a treasury. Some of its riches standing open to one and all, others surely more hidden so that we need to seek them out, to search and even strive to find them. And sometimes we don't have a strong enough light to guide us there. So we have to search harder, longer, more carefully, and not lose hope. We may feel that the search would go better if we had a faithful guide or companion to aid us. Sometimes we do. And sometimes the companion is a silent presence willing us onward, giving us the breath of life to continue. That too is a gift. For all this beneficence, we should give thanks. We want to give thanks. So Psalm 136 urges us, give thanks to the sacred oneness, the loving kindness that is forever. To know this truly is to know joy, not simple happiness, profound delight and gratitude for life itself, including its fragility and risks, along with its wonders and gratifications. We know all too acutely how inadequate we can be and how vulnerable we are. Yet in the face of that, we can raise our voices, sometimes in grief, sometimes in protest, sometimes in anger, but also in love and joy and gratitude, knowing that wherever we are, holiness is waiting to be made and discovered by us.